Um, thank you. We've just gone live on Facebook and we've also got Aman here. So I'm just going to introduce and then hand over to Aman to do um, his presentation, Digital Identity or Digital um, Dictatorship. Mm -hmm. So just to introduce myself, um, my name's Kate Mason. We're on the Central Coast, just an hour or so above Sydney, because this will be live streamed and people will be watching this around the world. Um, I stood for the Informed Medical Options Party in the federal election, which was two weeks ago. And we have a very concerned community around a number of factors. I came across Armin on, um, watched a video of him on Facebook where he was speaking about smart cities and asked him if he would be able to do a presentation to us and our community. So just to introduce Armin, so it's Armin Javi. Um, he has a high tech career spanning over 25 years. He was at the forefront of video and camera technology in Silicon Valley. He has co-founded two camera startups. And if you have a camera in your phone, stream video or movies, he played a part in it. Armin has a bachelor in electric and electronics engineering and masters in chemistry from India and a master's in chemical engineering from Penn State University. And he studied computer science at Stanford University. As a lover of liberty, Arman arrived in the US in 1988 in search of a free society and now resides in Big Fork, Montana. So he's being streamed in from Montana. Thank you so much for being here, Aman. It's a real pleasure. Thank you for your um, time. And we appreciate because we all feel like we need some more understanding about what's, what's soon to be rolled in. Um, just, just a little bit of housekeeping, if everyone could just make sure their mobile phones are turned off. So we're gonna pass it over to you and um, have you speak for about half an hour or 40 minutes with your presentation. And then we'll do some question and answers at the end um, and we'll go from there. So thank you and welcome. Thank you Kate for having me here. I really appreciate it. Uh, I just want to clarify, I have an electrical engineering masters from Penn State, not a chemical engineering. So, but that's a just minor detail. And uh, hello everyone. Uh, I hope that I can impart my knowledge here so that people know what's actually going on and can take actions in their local the neighborhoods and communities. So what I'm going to speak about is really about, uh, you know, what's happening in the world, and it all ties down to the digital identity. And it's being done through cameras and facial recognition. And you'll see how all the elements uh, of all the, you know, complexities of the world will be tied up into the digital identity. And so the question I ask, uh, you know, asked myself uh, a while ago is, is digital identity really going to be a dictatorship or are they one and the same thing? Um, and so, okay. So what I'm, tr the way I've broken up my presentation is initially, you know, I'm going to introduce what is facial recognition and how it's been sold to us as a public across the world and how it's being used. Uh, then I'll kind of move to sharing, uh, you know, how cameras and surveillance has been set up in China and across the world and how that is being sold to us. From there, we'll you know, transition to how a digital panopticon that's being built for our safety and security. And then I'll switch to uh, you know, a little bit on, I'll talk about smart cities and you know, how all the light, smart light infrastructure and all the surveillance is connected to you know, helping us along in the future. That's being sarcastic. And from there, I'll make a transition to you know, actually how the digital identity is going to be used in the future and how it's going to be implemented through the internet and all our devices. And then we can have a discussion on, you know, what we can do in our local neighborhoods and communities to try and counteract what's being done to us. So I'm, with that, I'm going to start my slides. All right, so how does facial recognition work? Uh, most of us, we use these smartphones and, and the introduction, the benefits to us and how it's been introduced is that you know, it unlocks your phone and it's convenient and it's also for our safety and security. So the way it works is there's an invisible or infrared projector inside your phone, which throws a beam of light. It's like actually what they call a structured light pattern. And that pattern gets distorted on your face. And that distortion is unique for every face in the world. 
and some sort of a you know a formula is computed and that formula is then matched to the formula and dots that have been stored in the phone and then it unlocks your phone when it authenticates your identity uh, when you are you looking at uh, facial recognition cameras which are not in your phone then that equation or the dot pattern is compared with millions of other images and faces in order to verify your authenticity so that's how facial recognition works in devices and cameras i'm just going to slow right, you right. Down. Aman, i'm just going to slow you down again i'm not sure it's computing through well enough okay sure i should go even slower no i'm and so is it from these speakers yeah it's um, I think you need to mute from your end. No, I have. I have been. I have been. So that's. Um, I've just unmuted myself just to speak now. So just keeps going. It's going to be. We have a bit of a crackly effect on this side. So just keep it slow, as slow as you can, and that kind of makes it a little bit easier. Once you speed up, we can't follow it. Okay. So the way this has been sold to us have been the carrots. It's for convenience, of course, and it's for our safety and security. And of course, it's to catch the bad guys. You know, it's to catch um, uh, terrorists and thieves and uh, child molesters. And as a society across the world, we have bought this story. And by the end of the presentation, or even I'd say 70% into this, you will see how the sticks are coming for all of humanity. And the sticks are going to be, uh, you know, sealing our fate. It's going to be really bad, right? The way it's been shown in China, you know, Big Brother has already met Big Data and facial recognition and cameras. They have been computing now for a few years, social credits for all the Chinese citizens. And social credits can be used to directly control the behavior of people. Right? I was at a conference in China in late 2019 in Shenzhen. And Shenzhen is kind of one of the ultimate smart cities already built by then. And this was the kind of uh, you know, surveillance that you see at every intersection, every building. So they have license plate readers, they have lane detection cameras, they have face recognition cameras. They are sucking up data in real time, 24-7. And they have screens everywhere you go in railway stations, in airports. And they are telling you, we are watching you. We know who you are. And we are going to keep watching you. And you're going to be OK with it. And there's this kind of a pro programming that's gone on. Apologies. Sorry, I got a phone call. I thought I'd shut off all my devices. Uh, so here's, you know, some girls showing off their social credit scores on an app. And what that does is it controls directly your behavior and your compliance based on how the algorithms and big brother wants you to behave. Right. So you'll see lots of documentaries from Australia, England, uh, United States, BBC's con continues to come up with documentary about every few weeks. And the narrative is that privacy and freedom are dead in China. Social credit control system is already there in China. And implicitly, we in the Western world are free. What they don't tell you is it's already happening here. We don't have any privacy or freedom. The credit scoring system has already started and we are not free. It's just that we have not yet been given an app to show us what our social credit scores are. At some point, they are going to do that and it's not too far from now, right? What is not said is that cameras per capita in the United States is greater than in China as of February, 2022. And London, which is one of the supposedly free cities in the world in a free country called the United Kingdom, it's number three in the world in terms of cameras per 1,000 people. So the infrastructure here is in place. All the systems are in place in the West, and they are expanding. And by 2025, $2 trillion would have been 
spent in establishing, in uh, installing the infrastructure of cameras, surveillance, and smart cities. And by 2030, that number is going to be at $7 trillion. And these reports have all been published. That's the kind of infrastructure that's being spent. So while the world was sleeping and COVID was announced in March of 2020, and the, most of the places in the world were locked down, in quarantine, and the fear TV was blasting in every home in the world, they were installing the smart city infrastructure with cameras and smart lights and smart poles. By the end of 2022, 1 billion surveillance cameras connected to the internet and to the cloud and artificial intelligence will have been installed. And that's for a population of 7 billion people. It's not to catch the bad guys, in case you hadn't figured that out. It's to catch all of us because we are all the bad guys. Right? And by the end of 2022, we are going to have over 20 billion data collection cameras that includes all our smartphones, home security cameras, your uh, cameras in automobiles, in, you know, when you reverse in autonomous driving cars and whatnot. So that's the kind of surveillance that's being done as we speak. So in the old days, uh, human eyeballs used to sit in front of TV screens to look at, you know, traffic or people running, you know, after stealing bank, stealing a bank or something. But that is so yesterday. Today we have smart artificial intelligence cameras that are effectively the security guards. They're connected to the cloud and in the cloud is running artificial intelligence and it's identifying and analyzing and logging and learning about every human being all the time in real time. So no human beings are necessary. We are being replaced by AI in probably 70% of activities around in the world. So when are we not alone? Pretty much never, not even in our own homes. And so here is a picture of what they call a panopticon. It's a circular prison. And this is a picture of a circular prison in a state of Rhode Island in the Northeast of the United States from the late 1920s. So you see that the prison guards are in the center and they can look at all the, you know, the prison cells. So all the prisoners basically are never in a private moment, you know? So they can be uh, monitored all the time at the whims of the guards that are in there. What we have today is a digital pan panopticon. So we are effectively, both symbolically and practically inside a prison cell. Even though you don't have the four walls, you know, erected yet, computer vision along with cameras and artificial intelligence is looking at us, analyzing us, logging us, and learning our behavior, and then it's going to be scoring us, and then rinse and repeat. So we are being monitored everywhere and all the time. Uh, there's, a, there's a term called the internet of eyes and ears that started popping up in venture capital circles about five, six years ago. And, uh, what they are literally building is the internet of eyes. And you can see pictures for in, in your daily lives where all the cameras are, right? At intersections, your self-driving cars and even modern cars today have between eight and 16 cameras, brand new cars that are coming out inside, inside them and uh, also looking outside. They're monitoring babies, they're monitoring drivers, they're monitoring the full cabin. Uh, they have satellite cameras, drone cameras, they have license plate readers, uh, they have uh, invisible infrared cameras looking at passengers and drivers. It's, it's ridiculous how much we are being uh, monitored all the time. And of course, it's always in the name of safety and security and convenience. Remember those words. Anytime you hear a television head speaking or reading the newspaper or social media, beware of those three words. And inside your home, we are all giving up our data and helping Big Brother. And I almost know nobody in this world who doesn't use technologies from one of these companies. We are on a Zoom call, by the way. So 
all these companies amongst many others are all involved in the so-called stakeholder capitalism that's being implemented. And every time, uh, you know, we are using our devices or not using our devices. If we are on a network connected to the internet, data is being collected on us. So this is not about surveillance. This is about data collection. And it, it's a, you'll, you'll see the difference as we continue the presentation. Uh, here's a picture at night with smart poles and smart street lights. They are being put up all around the world. Uh, the expectation is not the expectation. The reports have ex uh, said that by 2030, 600 million of these street lights will have been installed around the world. Just think about that. They have these bright, oppressive LED lights, which have kind of gotten rid of a natural darkness in our lives. And these are, I'm going to show you what, what these are about to do. But this is being sold as smart cities, which is for your, not only for your convenience, it's good for the environment and for global warming and climate change. And that's how they've been ushering these in. Here's an example of a you know, smart pole with a smart city light. They, have, they will have speakers to give instructions to people if they don't already in Australia. I think I've seen stuff from Melbourne that already has those. They'll have digital signage. It'll be sold for your convenience. But again, it's about giving instructions to people on how to behave. They're going to have face recognition cameras. They're going to have all sorts of pollution sensors. That's how they're selling it. The top of some of these lights is going to have drone charging stations. Why? Because drones are going to be the new aerial police, uh, you know, al along with other things. And uh, they, they are all going to be wirelessly connected to each other and to the internet. And this is part of the internet of things. And these smart cities are about data collection, number one. And it's, we are going to see how they're going to enforce people to behave, number two. Uh, so here's an example of, that's a picture somebody sent me from uh, Canada. And they've installed these things, what, are, what look like LED incapacitators. This was funded by the Department of Homeland Security and a company intelligent optical systems uh, in 2007 started to develop this. And then the next generation, more modern versions of these were done at Penn State universities, maybe 20 years after I graduated from that. And I, I don't know what the level of uh, you know, weaponry they have achieved already. And I'm researching that right now as we speak. But these are known as puke guns or puke rays. What they do is they can, um, send out you know, highly focused, highly, high intensity beams of different frequencies and colors before the human brain and eye can adapt to that. They'll change the frequency and basically it causes intracranial pressure. That's pressure in the brain. It's gonna make you puke. It can make you sick. It can cause uh, spinal problems and a whole lot of other problems. And these are already being installed around the world. Even the standard LED lights uh, and I'm researching this. I'm going to make a presentation solely on smart lights and smart cities uh, next. Uh, they, can, they will be used to enforce behavior. Uh, there are some of them that can see cars up to 300 meters away, uh, humans with their guns or without guns 150 meters away. I've also seen specs that there are certain smart lights that have the ability to see six miles away. So what we are this we, what they're installing is not lights for our safety or security or our convenience. They're installing an open air digital prison and they don't need human guards from, you know, three letter spook agencies to enforce all this stuff. It'll be enforced through artificial intelligence and all these electromagnetic weapons, whether they are, you know, microwave frequencies from towers or from 5G or with uh, LED lights. And for people who don't know what LED is, it's the light emitting diode and it's done in semiconductor processes and they can build millions of them in, in minutes. So, so far I talked about cameras, you know, face recognition, how, what is face recognition? Talked about cameras, the surveillance infrastructure, how it's being set up and a little bit on smart cities. Let's see how this now connects to the kind of the uh, the primary 
uh, message of this presentation, and it's about the digital identity. So here is a diagram on the right. Uh, this I found at, in a paper uh, at the World Economic Forum website, and it was published in 2018. And the digital identity, they say, is a new chapter in the social contract. It's a social contract that nobody signed up for and nobody wants, but they are you know, planting this on us and going to force this on us. And the digital, every entity, person, device, and thing is going to have a digital identity. And once you sign on to a digital identity, the only way you can access healthcare or your bank finances, ability to travel, ability to access the internet, to go to social platforms or do anything in your life, to buy food, you need a digital identity. And how will that digital identity be authenticated? Through your face. So your face is the key to unlocking access to life. And this key is going to be linked to a new type of financial system, which is going to be a combination of carbon credits, your social credits or social score, the, the technically correct term is um, reputation capital. And then of course your status with respect to vaccines and boosters and injections. And if you don't have enough carbon score, if you don't have any enough social score or you haven't taken your latest booster, your face will not be able to unlock your digital identity and therefore you cannot access stuff. You will be locked out of the whole new matrix system. And this is what they call central bank digital currency or CBDCs. Uh, they may have minor variations in different countries, but this is essentially the key to understanding what sort of a new world that is going to be uh, uh, you know, upon us once the final switches are turned on. And how does this link to smart cities? Because your face is going to be tracked wherever you're going. Your social score will be updated in real time based on who your friends are or whether you're social distancing, who you are walking with, when you're walking, when were you supposed to walk, et cetera, et cetera. And the universal basic income that they are now starting to uh, give in some countries, that's also about giving carbon credits. Your carbon credits are gonna be limited per month and that's how it's gonna go, right? So your digital identity is really a digital prison and your face is used to unlock the digital prison if you behave well. And how are they gonna implement this? There's a new protocol called zero trust in cybersecurity uh, uh, worlds of you know, software and server companies that are implementing this. And so by default, we are going from a world of implicit allow to default deny. So as an example, when you are log into your computer, you type in a password, and when you type in a password, you have access to all your browser, your files, your applications. But now this zero trust is about de default denial. It means we don't trust you. And for everything you need to do, you'll be denied initially until you can prove that you're trustworthy. And that trust will come from face recognition and your digital identity, right? And so this is going to be the new world. It's going to be a world with locks and anything we want to do anytime, all the time, whether you want to switch on your smart, uh, uh, you know, your smart oven or your, you know, open your smart refrigerator or get into the internet, get into Facebook, you're continuously being monitored by your face and your digital identity. So the concept of HTTPS, which is like secure authentication when you go to websites, everything is going to be removed because the algorithms and AI, they need to keep watching you, you and how you're behaving. They're going to be scoring your emotions. Uh, they're going to be tracking your eye movements and everything's going to be recorded all the time. So this is where we are going if we allow this to happen. Here's an example of how zero trust principles are going to be used when you go to the new shopping paradigm where all the doors are going to be digital screens, uh, you know, locked with some very heavy duty 
uh, plastics or uh, LEDs. And you want to be able to open the door without your digital ID. So digital ID is all about conditional access. So if you have your carbon credits for the month are expired, that door won't open to get beef. If you've had too much sugar for the first two weeks and your credits have expired for the sugar, the door won't open to get your orange juice. So these types of doors are going to have face recognition cameras and your digital ID will be used to unlock these doors. And there's something known as smart contracts. If people don't know, you'll start reading about it. Smart contracts is really the if then and else logic that goes behind this digital currency with social and carbon credits. And this concept is called identity as a service and identity as a service. There are many companies building businesses around it. Uh, they uh, leverage companies that do face recognition as a service. And every time your or anybody's face is in front of a camera, there's a chain of corporations making money in real time. So they found everybody's face is a, another great way to monetize uh, in Wall Street and beyond. And this is also going to be used for geofencing. Uh, geofencing is a term where symbolically, basically, you can, you're geographically, whether it's in the internet and the metaverse or in the physical world, they can build an invisible fence with your digital ID and control your access to everything. So where you can travel by airplane or where you can drive or how far you can drive, how far you can walk, where in the metaverse you can go, who you can communicate with, who you can text, what book you can read, what content of the book you can read, everything is going to be uh, monitored as well as manipulated. And where you can walk, they will limit you using all these puke guns and LED lights, because they are the weapons that are going to limit how far you can walk. And that's related to the 15 minute cities and 20 minute neighborhoods that they are building right now. So the goal is to lock down humanity in you know, these smart cities and not allow them to move anywhere pretty much. So the digital identity is inside the Trojan horse of security and privacy. I can't stress this enough. Whenever you heard, hear the word security and privacy, run. And this will result in total control of humans because people will comply in order to unlock access to life. And how is they going to use this with kids? There's a concept called social and emotional learning that's been creeping into schools for many years, the last few years. Uh, it's, it's also known as cell. And the goal is that all kids will be monitored from cradle to career. And cameras and face recognition and emotion recognition are going to be at the heart of this. So they can, even, they can even be monitoring the emotional state of a child and the algorithms can decide whether the, a child abuse is happening at home. And then they can come for the children, which they will. Here's an example of a little, this purple device. It's a talk pedometer. So whenever parents are talking to their child, the audio is going up to the cloud and AI is monitoring what, what, are the, uh, what the parents are telling the kids. So if you're not talking enough about global warming and climate change, your car carbon credits and social credits are gonna go low. So you will be controlled on what you tell your kids. In, in return, the kids will be getting programmed by whatever the AI wants you to tell your kids. Here's an example. And these are devices that are already in the market. These are not like futuristic devices. People are already buying them for, for their homes, thinking that these are really cool gadgets to get home. Here's an example of an LED game, game board, and it has fisheye cameras looking at the kids. And depending on how the kids are reacting, the AI board game can modify what's being shown on the screen. And so at the heart of all this is a digital ID, remember that, which requires cameras and face recognition. Uh, they're also going to be used further in Human, human capital value extraction. So they're gonna make money in secure, securitized futures markets, much like they did it, you know, going into the 2008 crash where they, were, they had all these uh, mechanisms to la do layer upon layer 
uh, of mortgage derivatives when the market crashed. So this is a new way of making money through faces and cameras. And so they can manipulate a child with SEL because what the child sees on the screen and what the camera sees, how the face, it can modify what it's showing on the screen. You start manipulating the behavior of children in, in, when they are in screen, uh, in front of a screen. That's why they've been giving free computers for kids uh, you know, all across the world. Uh, it's why they have uh, false flag shootings in schools and everyone is fighting for gun control versus gun rights. And uh, the fear TV is you know, blabbering all day long all over the world. It's about installing more security cameras and more face recognition cameras in the schools to keep the children safe. It has nothing to do with shootings. And people need to understand that. So here's an example of how they make money. They could go, go to top performers in a you know, given class of uh, schools uh, across a state or something, and they group them along with their pathways, as in predictions on where their life is going to go. And they gamble on that based on prodigy asset groups that they form. And the future results will give them all the social and carbon credits and all the cryptocurrency they have, they need. So they're going to make even more money from the broken kids because then there will be intervention. And when there's intervention, they can do all sorts of more betting on, on the behavior of kids going forward at different points in time in their career, you know, all the way from, again, from cradle to career. So this is just a game to the people who are you know, manipulating this whole human civilization as we speak. So the emphasis, so if, if there are any parents in the audience here or grandparents, you need to really understand that if you're sending your kids to schools, private or public, they will have cameras in them. They will be given devices. All the devices are looking at them all the time. And it's not about knowledge. It's all about social and emotional control of the kids. So I can't stress enough. If you have kids, take them out of school, start homeschooling them with your friends and family who are you know, pretty good at teaching. And now uh, last month, I think it was late, late April. Yeah, so late April, it came out on the Department of State website that the global internet is now a multi-stakeholder internet governance. So the World Economic Forum and the United Nations have taken over the internet, which is a direct uh, you know, message to the world. If you understand this, that the digital identity has to be accepted by everyone if you want access to communications. So it's a zero trust world that uses the digital ID and your face along with 3D cameras looking at your face to access the internet. This is where we are going. So if, if you don't accept a digital ID, you can't enter, enter the, in, you cannot get onto the internet and you cannot open your phone and you cannot make a phone call. And so I, I'll skip this, but uh, here, here in Montana, I can, I can change Montana to Sydney, Melbourne, Newcastle, whatever, you know, and there's cameras everywhere. And I, Montana, I live in a small place, you know, just 4,500 people, the closest town is half an hour away. And uh, when you go there, there are hundreds and hundreds of smart city lights. It's really disgusting. And we have uh, in our local state legislature, there's a study for facial recognition technology, and that's a complete red herring. So if you start seeing that in uh, states or cities in Australia, just know that banning facial recognition means nothing because your government, neither your government nor your state nor your local officials are doing facial recognition. So banning it is pointless because the facial recognition is gonna be done in the cloud on Amazon and Google servers with artificial intelligence algorithms, with cameras installed by private companies on public lands, which are now owned by private corporations. So I've been having a very interesting time trying to fight this here. And then over here, you know, this is a small place, but over here at the intersection and everywhere, we're seeing all this junk go up. You see microwave towers, you know, hidden inside trees on ski slopes, and you see them openly displayed inside the cities. It's pretty bad. And given pictures I've seen from Melbourne, Australia, this is pleasant. 
And so if you go to retail stores, now they start having, they have cameras at self-checkout counters as well as non-self-checkout counters because they're looking at everything you're buying. There are four facial recognition cameras when you enter any foyer now. So they've established who you are when you enter and they're gonna track you every square foot inside retail stores. And then this, you have the parking lot panopticons that are looking at all your cars and everybody. And then you have five cameras at this entrance. So it just goes on and on. This is not for safety and security. This is to track people, to do data collection, identity as a service, and then your digital ID tied to your behavior, your compliance, what you're buying, when you're buying, who you're with, everything. Here's an example of a company called Clearview AI. Uh, you know, investors, Peter Thiel, who's also invested in Palantir and working for Big Brother. And so every human being will be in its database if they aren't already, and they're gonna use the facial recognition and the image database for predictive policing and pre-crime for stakeholders. And uh, this movie was Minority Report, which came out probably 15 or 16 years ago. So they were telling us what's coming. It's not science fiction. There's a company called ID.me that is doing public-private partnerships. Um, their goal is inclusivity, diversity, et cetera, et cetera, no identity left behind. And it's also for equity, so everybody's equal. But really, it's about taking your password, combining it with your uh, driver's license, your passwords, and then doing digital selfies to unlock government and uh, services like healthcare or retirement and stuff. So they are gonna suck us all, uh, all in into the digital ID system one way or the other. And people need to understand that so that they can say no. Because once we accept a digital identity, it's game over for human civilization. Everybody will be fully controlled and you will behave in exactly how they want you to behave. Uh, a few weeks ago, I, I was watching a talk by Yuval Harari. He's a spokesperson and a, an author for the World Economic Forum. And he presented this danger formula where B, gosh, I'm so sorry. B times C times D equals R. Where B is biological knowledge that they are picking up through your smart watches, your PCR tests, your DNA tests. Compute power is all the... Com compute power on the servers, that's unlimited now. They're printing all the money in the world to make as many servers to collect our data and compute. And then the D is the data they are gathering from the smart cities and all the sensors. And B, so this is the, gives them the ability to hack humans in their transhuman agenda of those people who've been doing research. What we can do, and they are trying to censorize everything, what we can do is to minimize the data we give them. If we are able to take out the sensors, take them down legally, work with your sheriffs and whoever your authorities are and educate them on what's coming and tell them that this is going to be really used for extremely nefarious purposes, right? So just, Another way to think about it is artificial intelligence is the beast. You cannot get rid of AI. It's already there and it's the beast. The beast needs food. Data is the food and the data conduit is all the sensors, the smart city infrastructure, the 5G towers, the, your telephone, your cameras at home, your microphones at home, cars and everything, they are the data conduit. So in order to stop the beast, you need to get rid of the data conduit. We, the data is going to be there because humans are going to do everything all the time, right? We're going to meet our friends, we're going to go here, whatever. So it's the data conduit which needs to be addressed. You can't address the data, you can't address AI. Because data and the sensors, they, are, they feed the beast. I'll say it again. And so the final lockdown requires cameras and face recognition sold to us as privacy and security. And that face is now used for digital ID, which is linked to a central banking digital currency. 
and that's the final lockdown. So we are always in lockdown mode, always. And so call to action is no digital ID, which means no face recognition, no cameras. Look up and observe cameras, LED lights, street lights, smart cities. These are installed incrementally and they are done at night and people are looking at their phones so they don't observe what's being done to them. You know, parents, go to your schools and take action. There are cameras in, you know, parking lots, in the hallways, in the laptops and everywhere. So your kids are being monitored and the SES scoring has begun and they are being manipulated. And figure out in your areas who installed, authorized and funded the smart city surveillance infrastructure. I've managed to decode it here, it's, but it's very hard for the, the local politicians. Uh, right now, they're, fi they're finding it very hard to kind of address these issues. So we have to come up with other creative ways to address this. And uh, if anyone wants to reach out to me independently, I can you know, share with them you know, how, what all I've in, uncovered and how they've done it so successfully. All right, so, but the real thing is that in your local neighborhoods, we the people didn't ask for these monstrosities. We don't want them. And we need to let everybody know that. It's our land, we are living here. We don't want this stuff, All right? So basically the whole infrastructure that's been set up, we have silent weapons that have been installed and are pointing at us. And once the final switches are turned on, humanity will be in invisible chains. And most of the world won't even know what happened because they'll be watching TV. So turn off your televisions, please. And that concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to take questions.